Imagine being an American sailor back in 1775. Your life is uniformly horrible, your food disgusting, your living conditions cramped and unsanitary. You go on long voyages punctuated by brutal battles. In those days, sailors who didn't jump ship by night almost certainly daydreamed of mutiny. It's no wonder captains wanted a seagoing police force to keep the sailors in line, a force of armed toughs who could keep the rabble down. Those men were the first Marines. As time passed, the job of the seagoing cops expanded. During battle, they nestled high in the rigging, raining musket fire and grenades onto the decks of opposing ships. As the ships locked in hostile embrace, the Marines jumped the rail, engaging the enemy in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. 220 years later, Marines are still serving on ships. No longer are there masts for them to climb or mutinies to put down. Now, when an international crisis arises, Marines answer the call. They are America's ultimate 911 force. In the modern world, the Navy's job is power projection. They can do that. They have the ships and the aircraft to loiter and attack anywhere in the world. But warfare in the littorals is a three-dimensional game, and that third dimension is the ground. To project power effectively, the Navy has to have a ground force. Uh, the Marine Corps, really the Navy Marine Corps team, give uh, the Commander-in-Chief the capability uh, of an amphibious force in readiness that can go virtually any place uh, in the world, taking advantage of the fact that about 75% of the world is covered by uh, oceans and seas, and uh, have the flexibility, a combined arms approach, a certain amount of sustainability to protect uh, U.S. interests wherever the need may be. The Marine Corps actually falls under the Department of the Navy. It provides much of the supportive infrastructure for the Corps. The Navy buys the ships and some of the aircraft and supplies all of the Corps' medical care. But the Marine Corps Commandant sits on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and has an equal say on defense matters. Out of more than a million and a half active duty military members, only around 170,000 are Marines. At first glance, the Corps seems to duplicate elements of the larger services. Marines fight on the ground, like the Army. They use fixed-wing fighter aircraft, like the Air Force, and they routinely serve aboard ships, as do sailors. We are the forward edge. We're out there for uh, the purpose of, if anything were to happen, instead of trying to round everybody up back here, you already have the Fleet Marine Force out front. Seven out of every 10 Marines belong to the Fleet Marine Force, the muscle of the Marine Corps. These are combat Marines who spend most of their careers deployed to some trouble spot or training to fight. Marine Corps strength comes from its versatility. Each potential crisis is an intricate puzzle. The challenge is finding the right combination of pieces to complete the picture the right mix of people and equipment to get the job done. We have to, as best we can, project uh, what the game will be, what the crisis may be, and train to that crisis as much as we can, but in a much broader scale. So if we weren't right on the mark, uh, that team can still play and win. At its heart, the Marine Corps is an infantry organization the best weapon system the Corps has, or at least the one that has made the most impact, is the grunt on the ground. One thing that's unique about the Marine Corps is that every Marine is a rifleman. 
That Marine's basic weapon is the M16 rifle, a nine pound 5.56 millimeter automatic that packs a 30 round magazine. The M16 can kill an enemy soldier at up to 800 meters, over half a mile. It's been a long time, however, since anyone won a war with just a rifle. When the Marines storm ashore, they bring with them a wide array of state-of-the-art weaponry. For long-distance shelling, the Marines pack M198 howitzers, which can rock a target with a six-inch projectile at 15 miles. Though artillery is, at heart, a primitive weapon, the contemporary updates to it have vastly increased its impact. Modern warfare requires not only broad artillery barrages, any amateur with a thousand rounds can do that. Today's coordinated assaults require putting the first round not only on target, but at the exact moment it's supposed to be there. For more direct fire, there's the tow guided missile system. Designed as a tank killer, the tow can be carried into battle by infantry, fired from a Cobra helicopter or from the back of a Humvee. As the tow speeds toward its target, it pays out a wire behind it, allowing its operator to control and adjust its flight path. Since the Gulf War, the Marine Corps has been replacing the venerable M60 with the state-of-the-art M1A1 Abrams tank. Though the M1 was originally designed for and deployed by the Army, the Marines have adopted it to their own unique battle doctrine. The Army uses tank battalions to go head-to-head -head with similar enemy units. The Marines use the tanks in smaller numbers, mainly to support and protect the soldiers carrying the M16. The M1 packs a 120-millimeter gun that is highly accurate to about a mile, a distance one of their shells covers in about a second. The M1 can fire anti-tank or anti-personnel hardware, making it a deadly battlefield tool. Unfortunately, the M1 is a logistics nightmare. Its turbine engine is a gas guzzler, about two gallons to the mile, and it weighs 25,000 pounds, which makes it hard to transport. The element of surprise is key to the success of an amphibious assault. The Marines mount their attacks from far offshore. A dock landing ship will usually sit off the coast about 25 miles over the horizon, out of sight of all but the most sophisticated detection devices. The belly of the ship is loaded with Marines waiting for the bus to take them to dry land. All these weapon systems we got can take any objective in the world, but the only one weapon system we got that can take it and hold it is the infantry. Transportation is key to the Marine mission. To get themselves and their equipment from ship to shore, the Marines use two basic landing craft. The first, designed to get the all-important foot soldier ashore, is the Armored Assault Vehicle, or AAV. It has tracks like a tank and thin aluminum armor. But unlike a tank, it swims. The basic version of the AAV is 26 feet long and officially can carry 25 Marines. Of course, if a squad of Marines has brought aboard the usual necessities, radios, explosives, and the like, you'll be more likely to squeeze only 13 Marines in its belly. It's noisy, smelly, and cramped. But as Marines like to say, the worst ride is still better than the best walk. Finally, there is the Landing Craft Air Cushion, or LCAC. Owned by the U.S. Navy, but operated for the Marines, the LCAC uses four jet engines to fly over the waves. Loaded with up to 75 tons of tanks, trucks, and LAVs, the LCAC can cruise over water at up to 50 miles an hour, with a range of more than 300 miles. No matter how good an infantry might be, no commander is going to let his troops set foot on hostile soil until he knows they're safe from enemy aircraft. It's a familiar image, Marines charging up the beach. But Marines don't just charge on the ground anymore. They also attack from the sky. 
some of the most important work of marine aviation is done long before the grunts even hit the beach. Air is a force multiplier, and we know what battlefield prep can do. Uh, you don't send a, a marine where a bullet or a bomb can effectively do the job. The role of deep air support is to attack enemy targets that are not engaged with friendly forces. Deep air support was what happened to Baghdad the night Desert Shield became Desert Storm. The Marines have several aircraft that can penetrate enemy airspace, but the best among them is the F-A-18 Hornet. Unlike the single-seat Navy version, the Marine Hornet has room for a pilot and his weapons system officer, or WIZO. It's the pilot's job to maneuver through the enemy's defenses, and it's the WIZO who puts the bomb on target. Operating primarily from aircraft carriers, the Hornet is by no means the fastest bird in the sky, but it's agile and capable of performing in all types of weather. Close air support, viewed by the Air Force as somewhat beneath them, is the glory mission for Marine Air. Putting bombs and bullets on an enemy only meters from friendly forces requires a high degree of skill and training. Uh, we call CAS putting, uh, putting a bomb within a thousand feet of friendly lines, hitting accurately and uh, taking out whatever the ground side needs to be taken out so they can accomplish their mission and continue to push. The Marine Corps has added incentive to get close air support right. There's a bond between the guy in the plane and the guy on the ground that transcends the chain of command. It has to do with the fact that they earned the same uniform. They come from the same family. Everyone on that battlefield is a Marine. Close air support is the primary job of the AV-8 Harrier and the AH-1 Cobra. British designed and built by McDonnell Douglas, the Harrier is a miracle of modern technology and something of a freak as well. It's not designed for air-to-air -air combat and doesn't even carry rudimentary air-to-air -air radar what it does do is defend troops on the ground. Its angle rate bombing system and excellent fire control computer makes it an extremely accurate platform for delivery of bombs, rockets, and cannon fire. And its ability to take off and land from any weed patch, dirt road, or tennis court means the Harrier can be based near the Marine infantry units that it supports. It uses 21,000 pounds of vectored thrust to muscle its way on and off the ground like a helicopter and can then turn and jet forward at 635 miles per hour. I like to say we're the four-wheel drive of, of aviation. We, we can uh, manage to put anything anywhere uh, as needed to support the ground element. Vertical takeoffs consume a tremendous amount of fuel so normally you will see the Harrier take off down a runway or a flight deck, conserving its fuel to fly farther or carry heavier bombs. The Harrier's more conventional partner is the AH-1 Cobra helicopter. Originally deployed as a gunship late in the Vietnam War, today's Cobra is a dedicated tank killer. It is swift, rugged, and carries laser-guided Hellfire anti-armor missiles. The call for fire comes from the forward air controller, usually a marine pilot temporarily assigned to a ground combat element. As the attack develops, he coordinates the close air support mission with the amphibious assault, making sure the bombs and bullets fall on the enemy rather than on the marines. No battle plan can work if the trigger puller runs out of food and bullets. That's where the combat service support group comes into play. We provide supplies. Uh, we commonly refer to it as beans, bullets, and band-aids, and quite literally, that's what it is. The faithful pickup truck for the Corps is the CH-46 Sea Knight. The Sea Knight delivers troops, weapons, food, ammunition, and supplies required by a task force operating far from the ship. It's an imposing sight, but still just the baby brother to the CH-53 Sea Stallion the biggest rotary wing aircraft in the U.S. Armed Forces. The Sea Stallion is designed to haul heavy artillery, 
up to 32,000 pounds inside or on its external cargo hooks. It also carries up to 55 Marines. There's a wide range of skills in a combat service support group. Most of the jobs have civilian equivalents, such as truck drivers and the mechanics who keep the trucks rolling, doctors and dentists, forklift operators, heavy equipment operators, and logistics specialists. They're decisive in that they give us the sustainability that we need to go someplace where perhaps there is no water and to create fresh water, potable water, where there is no power to make power, where you need to prepare the beach to land across it. Those are support functions that we can't do what we do without. These services are critical because tacticians know that logistical limitations can determine the outcome of a battle. So the Combat Service Support Detachment has to be able to meet the demands of the fighting forces. They're trigger pullers. We're logisticians. Without them, we have no reason to exist. And without, without us, they can't exist. The strength of the Marines is the Corps' ability to handle anything. It is the only branch of the service with infantry, helicopters, air superiority fighters, armor, and ships at its disposal. Of course, not every 911 call is a five alarm fire, and not every international incident requires a desert storm. The key is flexibility. It's difficult to explain how you really feel when all of a sudden we're not training anymore. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's real. And once you, you do receive that call, the first thing runs through your mind is, oh boy, we gotta go, it's time. A Marine Expeditionary Unit floating around the middle of the Indian Ocean is dispatched to the shores of a distant troublemaking nation. As preparations begin for an amphibious assault, it's clear that the mission will require more firepower than a Mew can provide. Another forward deployed amphibious assault ship chops into the area, carrying additional Marines and equipment. A nearby aircraft carrier battle group steams into the picture. Beaches are selected for landing, and units are assigned to those beaches. The attack phase begins according to a precise schedule, with naval gunfire and aircraft attacking the beach defenses. Meanwhile, the landing forces wait for the impending amphibious assault. Weapons are checked and rechecked. Heads are counted and recounted. Whatever rivalry that may exist between the sailors and the Marines disappears. They know that we're sailing that ship to send them into harm's way, possibly, when they go to the beach. We know that they could get shot at and they could get killed. Finally, it's time to mount up. The LCAC's aircraft engines roar to life, and the ship drops its ramp, exposing the well deck to the sea. A sister ship not far away begins disgorging armored assault vehicles crammed with Marines. Helicopters pass overhead. Higher up, F-18s pass through the sound barrier on their way to distract the enemy. A spear is forming, and the point of that spear sitting anxiously in a cramped landing craft is the Marine with the M16. The half hour ride to shore is anything but fun. Marines liken it to sitting in a metal cork bobbing its way to the beach. The air bombardment lifts just seconds before the assault elements come ashore. If the timing is right, the defenders will be in a state of shock, vulnerable, even helpless. The track driver coordinates with the other AAVs to navigate to the designated landing spot. As the tracks grab for sand, the Marines throw open the hatch and explode onto the beach. It is the job of the first elements ashore to secure the beach for the others who will follow. Harriers and Cobras hover overhead. Hornets are destroying enemy communications, preventing reinforcement and reaction. All of the elements come together to make the intricate seem effortless. It all breaks down to the individual Marine. 
that Marine whose ancestors began as little more than a seagoing police force. 